Okay, there's a voice recording for the cell cycle. Talk through some of the key, key things to help you out with the uh, major difficulties that students might have with the cell cycle and mitosis and specifics. All right, so the purpose of doing mitosis is, like it's saying here, uh, for damage or for growth of the individual. And in some rare cases, we might need to do it for reproduction, which in a lot of cases, we give that a separate term. And that separate term is binary fission. Uh, for humans, we go from a diploid number of 46 to two new cells that are 46 and exactly the same as the starting cell. So to go diploid to diploid, keep things the same. We don't want things to mess up or change as we're going through these divisions because it's all about keeping things uh, consistent over the long term of the organism. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how things are packed up. So here you have a picture of a chromosome. Um, this chromosome in this picture has two sister chromatids, so one and two. Um, and what the key things are of this uh, chromosome is, and the reason of the term chromatid, is to allow you to know that the left side is the exact same copy as the right side. So if we were to be able to condense chromosomes not in mitosis, maybe in G1, they would look more like this. They don't have a duplicate side, and we would just call them chromosomes. Uh, not until they get that duplicate side are they called a chromosome with chromatids. So the way things get packed up, here's a DNA strand, uh, and the DNA strand will get wrapped around a protein, uh, which we call histones. So when we take the DNA, we wrap around these balls of protein called histones, and then we wrap the wraps and wrap the wraps and wrap the wrap, 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 all the way up. We get this condensed structure, which you see as a cr uh, chromosome. When DNA and histones are together, we call it chromatin, right? So chromatid, chromatin, similar sounding, different things. Chromatin is the DNA histone complex. And so when DNA and histones or the chromatin condenses, you can finally see these chromosomes, which is really only going to happen during mitosis. Um, the chromatin is always there in the nucleus. Um, just whether or not it condenses, can you actually see these structures that we call a chromosome. And like it shows here, uh, the two sister chromatids are joined at the center by a thing called a centromere. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the centromere and what is inside that centromere that is valid for our understanding of mitosis. All right, so let's talk the cell cycle. So here's the cell cycle, which includes the large part of interphase, and there's a small wedge of mitosis. Uh, remember, the goal of mitosis is to divide the nuclear material. And it's kind of hard to see on here, but there should be an overlaid wedge over the top of mitosis that is for cytokinesis, because cytokinesis is the division of the cytoplasm. So it is possible that if we did mitosis and not cytokinesis, our resulting cell would have just two nuclei in it, and they wouldn't be divided. There could obviously be problems with this because now you have two brains of the cell coordinating events in here. There's probably going to be some errors uh, and maybe some autophagy. The cell might get destroyed uh, in some way, shape, or form because of that problem that has occurred. All right, so let's talk G1S and G2 of interphase. G1 and G2 are all about growth. Maybe it's in cell size. Maybe it's about organelles, but it stands for growth. S is about synthesizing the DNA. So we're actually going to take a chromosome, and if we could see it in this phase, go from this shape, so the by the time S is over, making the chromosome look more like this, where it has its duplicate copy or chromatid now attached. In G2, it would stay that way. And then by the time mitosis is over, back in this nucleus, if we could still see them, <clears throat> they would look like that. So single arm chromosomes versus double armed chromosomes, so to speak. Or chromosome without chromatids, chromosome with chromatids. So this is the cell cycle. Very small wedge of time is for mitosis. The majority of it is during all this interphase component. So we'll come back to some of the checkpoints near the end of this uh, presentation. All right, so let's talk phases. So here's one of the first phases, although it is a circle, so there's really no beginning or end. Um, this is interphase, right? So I for interphase. And the reason I have labeled it as interphase is you can't see any chromosomes. The chromatin has not condensed. We still see a nucleolus. We still see a nucleus present. Um, we see these centrioles, which are these pieces, only found in animal cells. And this aster, or centrosome, 
And out of this centrosome is where the spindle fibers or microtubules will start radiating from later on. But we will have to duplicate the centrioles or the centrosomes before that event happens. All right, so that's I. This is not part of meta or mitosis. Uh, interphase is not considered mitosis, so make sure you know that. Only P, M, A, and T are parts of mitosis. So let's look at the next piece, which is prophase. Now, in prophase, we can finally see the chromosomes. Notice the nucleolus is gone. The nucleus, because it's still early prophase, is still present around the outside. But the chromosomes are definitely visible. Now, in the centromere area right here, you can see some darker discs. Those are going to be the kinetochores. The kinetochores are going to be the areas where the microtubules, some of them, are going to connect to. Some of the microtubules will not connect to the kinetochores. And we'll talk about the difference between those in a little bit here as well. So uh, notice that this chromosome, I'm going to label as 1, and this chromosome, labeled as 2, are about, uh, based on the picture, the exact same size. And then 3 and 4 are about the same size. So it's almost like we have two pairs of chromosomes. And the reason for it, this is a diploid organism, and diploid is something we'll talk about even more as we continue on the year. But diploid, we denote it to 2n. Uh, means that we have full sets of chromosomes. So it's not you have just one out of the two. You have both in the set. And the reason is one comes from dad and one will come from mom. And you should have matching sets for the most part. We'll talk more about the sex chromosomes and how in some individuals it is not a matching pair. But So this individual has four chromosomes. Its diploid number is four. Um, if it only had half, its haploid number would be two. And we'll talk about haploid more when we talk about forming gametes, which is uh, done in meiosis. So we have chromosomes, four of them. They all have sister chromatids, so we'd say there's eight total chromatids in here, four total chromosomes. All right, so that's prophase, right? So P for prophase. The next picture is metaphase. We skipped later prophase. Uh, you could probably reason how that would happen, the dissolving of the nucleus, chromosomes getting attached to moving towards the center. So here we have the metaphase plate that they're lined up on. So this is metaphase. Notice that some of the microtubules, like this one, is connected to that kinetochore, and this other microtubule is connected to the other kinetochore. So we have two microtubules, one to each kinetochore, and they're all single file chromosomes down the middle. They're not in pairs, like we'll see in meiosis. Uh, in one of the stages, they come up in pairs, so there'll be a small one with its homologous pair partner sitting next to it, a big one with its homologous pair partner sitting next to it. Here they're all single file. Each kinetochore uh, has two, or has one microtubule, but for the whole centromere, uh, there's two microtubules, one for either side. And then there's the other microtubules, which we call the non-kinetochore microtubules. Those are actually going to push the cell, so they'll elongate the uh, kinetochore microtubules, like this one, kinetochore micro is going to pull the chromatids apart. So this is metaphase. Right? Let's move on to the next phase, which is anaphase. And you can see here in anaphase uh, how the chromosomes are pulled apart now. Uh, at this point, we say that they don't have chromatids. The kinetochore microtubules have gotten substantially shorter. The non-kinetochore microtubules have gotten substantially longer, and hence the elliptical shape that's forming here. Still chromosomes present, uh, just not chromatids, T-I-D, okay, no chromatids. All right, now we're on telophase. Uh, the chromosomes have uh, uncoiled their chromatins, so now you can't see them anymore. Nucleolus reforms, nucleus reforms, uh, and then at the same time that telophase is happening, which is the reforming of these nuclei, this is happening, which is the pinching together of the cell. That's a separate event. It is not part of mitosis. It's called cytokinesis. Cytokinesis is a separate event, but it is important in order to accomplish uh, the formation of new cells. Uh, in an animal cell like this one, it can pinch together because it forms what's called the cleavage furrow. In a plant cell that is rigid around the outside because it has a cell wall made out of cellulose, it can't pinch together, so it starts forming little cellulose little plates, right? So it's called a cell plate. And eventually it gets thick enough that it'll divide the cell, uh, much like the around the perimeter that was originally there. So it'll be a nice, strong, solid 
two cells at that point. All right, so that's all of mitosis. Let's talk the next part, which is how the cell controls itself. So one of the ways the cell controls itself is by having checkpoints in place. And there's two major checkpoints you should know for the test. The first one is G1. And the purpose of checkpoints, I should say, is kind of like a video game. You have objectives that you need to accomplish before you can move on to the next level. Same thing here with checkpoints. We need to grow the proper amounts of organelles, get the right amounts of substances before we can move on to the next stage. So if a cell doesn't get these, it'll either sit at that zone or, in the case of a lot of cells, it'll pull out of this spot and pull into what's called GO, which is a non-dividing state um, of the cell's life. Some cells, once they go into GO, they stay there forever, like cells in the central nervous system. This is where scientists are trying to figure out ways to call them back out of GO or supplement those cells so that they can actually divide and uh, fix problems that people might have with the central nervous system. Other cells, like your skin cells, if they're put into GO, they can actually be called back out of GO, get back into the cycle, and finish their division if need be. This one, G2, that you have to know um, is a little bit more detailed only because you should understand the interactions that are available with enzymes. Okay, so enzymes are a key part of G2 checkpoint. So let's take a look at that. The way that the enzyme and the name of the enzyme um, works is the enzyme is called CDK or cyclin dependent kinase. And cyclin dependent kinase requires cyclin. What's cyclin? Cyclin is another protein. It's not an enzymatic protein. It's more like an allosteric promoter. So it fuses into enzyme cyclin dependent kinase. So here's cyclin. And when the two join together, they activate this complex. And the complex is called MPF, which stands for mitosis promoting factor or maturation promoting factor. So when these two join together, it activates the, the destruction of the nucleus. Uh, it activates some um, cell signaling pathways that allow for microtubules to start forming more and progressing towards mitosis. So you're going to see the buildup in the concentration of cyclin, right? So this is cyclin concentration building up as it goes through. This is all of interphase up here, right? As it goes through interphase, it's, it starts building up. So more and more of it will randomly bump into cyclin-dependent kinase, activate and become MPF, which allows the cell to slip into mitosis. Notice by the end of mitosis, the cyclin levels go down substantially, which means that cyclin is getting destroyed, probably by another enzyme. We don't want to destroy cyclin-dependent kinase because we're going to reuse it, uh, but we can destroy cyclin, and that'll deactivate MPF and allow us to get out of mitosis. If we don't do this control factor, cells can grow out of control, and that out of control grow is called cancer, which you maybe have heard about. So cancer is literally just abnormal cell growth. So most cells should follow checkpoints, right? And the two that we've talked about, there's actually more. And the two we talked about are here. So cancer won't follow these checkpoints. It'll go right past the checkpoints, uh, do continuous mitotic divisions. Uh, and because of it, it ends up not following key things that regular cells do. Uh, one of the regular cell things that uh, or laws or ideas that they follow is what's called cell, uh, cell um, density dependency. So they follow the cell density rule so that if cells are broken, right, so if we have a, a break in the skin, we need to divide to fill this gap. They would divide until they touch each other and then they stop their cell cycle going for mitosis. Cancer will continue to divide and just continue to divide and continue to divide, and we end up getting lumps that we might call cancer, uh, cancerous tumors or whatnot. Uh, the other thing that they don't follow is anchorage. Uh, so normally, if a cell is anchored down, it can go through the cell cycle and divide. But if they flake off, they can't divide anymore. Cancer can flake off, continue to divide, anchor itself somewhere else, and then divide there as well. That's how liver cancer could spread to pancreatic cancer can spread to colon cancer, lung cancer, uh, is because of this event. And that's called metastasizing. When the, when the cancer has metastasized, it means that it's lost grip of its original tumor location. It's starting to spread throughout the body. The other wicked thing that cancer has is immortality. So as long as it's getting the nutrients, it can live forever. 
and we'll talk about its connections in immortality to a, a type of cell called stem cells, which are good cells, uh, and how scientists are trying to overcome the issue of possibly taking stem cells and injecting stem cells and accidentally getting cancer in there. There's, there's ways that scientists are trying to fix that. So they are immortal. So you ask yourself, well, so who cares? So what? It takes up space. Well, space sometimes can damage other organs. Like if it's in the skull, there's limited space. We start having things grow. They can really squeeze out the brain. That's not good. Um, they also will suck nutrients from all the surrounding cells. And if they're doing that, they're killing the surrounding cells. And in turn, obviously, the person can get very sick. So there's your connection of cancer to mitosis. You understand the cell cycle. If you have any other questions, let me know. Otherwise, good luck on your studies.